Um, we will be uh, spending the evening tonight, if you agree, in the company of Louis Stephen Saint Laurent, who was Prime Minister of Canada between 1948 and 1957. He has a dubious distinction. He is arguably Canada's least known Prime Minister. That is, if we ignore the four leaders who rapidly succeeded one another after Sir John A. Macdonald's death. Saint Laurent remained in power for nine years. This is just as long as both Brian Mulroney and Stephen Harper, and nearly as long as Robert Borden. It is also longer than either R.B. Bennett, John Diefenbaker, or Lester Pearson, all of whom are infinitely better known, both among historians and in popular memory. I'd like to ask aloud and suggest a few answers. What might explain Saint Laurent's near absence on our historical radar? I think two factors may account for it. The first factor is factual and serious, so to speak. The second, perhaps not as serious, but just as factual. The first factor is for, to account for our collective amnesia regarding this gentleman is a happy one. By and large, the Saint Laurent years were pleasant and prosperous. And naturally, both sci social scientists and the public at large tend to focus on times of crisis. No news, as we say, uh, good news, as we say, is no news. But fortunately for Canada, if unfortunately for Saint Laurent's brand name recognition, the country enjoyed nine good years during his leadership. Socially speaking, Canada was either enjoying or at least tolerating a high degree of conformity at that time. By and large, Canadians, like most Westerners, did not question existing traditions and assumptions, whether familial, musical, or attitudinal. There were no leather jackets, no agitation around equal pay for equal work, uh, no claiming for a legalized abortion, a word that was never uttered in polite circles. There was no rock and roll, no LSD, and the acronym LGBTQ had not been invented while its underlying meaning was only alluded to in hushed tones. The rise of social debate would begin in the 1960s, well past Saint Laurent's retirement. And when it came to the national unity front, the Saint Laurent years in power were largely uneventful. There was none of the bilingualism trauma that haunted or inspired Pearson or Trudeau, and no referenda on Quebec sovereignty. On the military front, Canada, yes, did get involved in the Korean War in the early 1950s, but its participation didn't last overly long, didn't cost a fortune, didn't result in high casualties, and didn't rip the country apart on the home front. <coughs> Maestro, first uh, uh, image, please. Demographically, Canada under Louis Saint Laurent enjoyed massive growth. Rising birth rates and post-war prosperity contributed considerably. His was the age of the baby boom, the bungalow, the red CCM tricycle, the Lone Ranger TV series, Mr. Potato Head, and the Slinky, although not yet the age of Barbie or Light Bright. That would be for the 1960s kids. New image, please. Immigration also played a major part in the Saint Laurent years. In addition to providing a haven for U European refugees and immigrants fleeing nightmarish conditions and economic and political misery, Holocaust survivors, a sizable influx of people from Greece, Portugal, and Hungary, for instance, Canada continued to integrate a steady flow of British immigrants. The national population leapt from 11,500,000 in 1941 to over 14 million in 1951 and to over 18 million in 1961. 
That type of increase is a tangible index of cultural health and national optimism. Oh, I just realized I have the magic object, so I guess I will try to. We will do. Otherwise, I will rely on Mr. Dance for technological prowess. Yeah, you see, I should have. <laughs> okay, uh, give me a second chance. Last but not least, the economy was booming during the Saint Laurent years. Alas for him and his government's place in memory, again, good news mean no news. We will leave it to professional economists to identify what of, his, um, <clears throat> of this economic upsurge may be attributed to Saint Laurent himself and his managerial skills, to his very competent cabinet, and to a rapidly growing and well-schooled class of mandarins in the civil service. We will also leave professional economists to determine the impact of a need for massive reconstruction in Europe and Japan, the availability of Canada's vast resources, and a similar golden age in the US. Either way, the result is a rather rosy picture. Consumption and incomes rose faster than the population. There was no federal budget deficit. Throughout most of the 1950s, unemployment hovered between 3 and 4 percent. I mentioned two broad factors that may account for our collective amnesia regarding Saint Laurent. One was a series of good grades on Canada's report card. The, no. ah. the other factor, well, is that the prime minister was remarkably unremarkable as a person. In fact, he embodied the adjective boring. His immediate predecessor, William Lyon Mackenzie King, was also stupefyingly dull. But the fact of having governed, governed for 22 years, having faced a depression, and having been in charge during the Second World War ensures that Mackenzie King cannot be as easily erased from memory. Saint Laurent, however, didn't even have the opportunity or the burden of preside, presiding over a country during a world war. With his good manners, his starched colors, he would never be seen tireless a voice that was never raised, a composure that was never ruffled, either with anger or laughter, as well as his very age, given that he was prime minister between the ages of 66 and 75, Saint Laurent looked like a chairman of the board in the words of one of his former advisors, Maurice Lamontagne. Saint Laurent looked like a doting godfather or benevolent uncle his nickname, in fact, was Uncle Louis. And although he proved surprisingly popular, indeed, he was the liberal's greatest asset come election time, he cannot compete in contemporary memory with the roaring lion from Saskatchewan, John Diefenbaker, or the dandy Montreal philosopher king, Pierre Trudeau. We should add that boring Saint Laurent in his time was in good company. This long period was marked, for instance, by Leslie Frost in Ontario, General, former General Eisenhower in the US, Conrad Adenauer in Germany, and Alcide de Gasperi in Italy. With a few exceptions, of course, it seems that uh, Western nations during the post-war years wanted their leaders to be slightly balding men relatively advanced in years, who did not rock the boat, while also exuding a confident message of prosperity and tranquility. This was in marked con uh, contrast to the furor of the 1939-1945 fur of 1939-1945 and the excitement of the 1960s. It was the age of father knows best. Bland, perhaps, but this may have been what the people then needed or wished to have. And besides, as Bill Davis later reminded us, bland works, or at least it did back then. Saint Laurent, I am getting quite a... Yeah. 
uh, proficient at it. Saint Laurent emerged onto the national stage in 1941 at age 59. He was handpicked by Prime Minister Mackenzie King to be his Quebec lieutenant, or I think I have to pronounce lieutenant, and his possible successor following Ernest Lapointe's sudden death. Mackenzie King needed a competent figure from Quebec, one who could maintain the solid support of French Canadians for the Liberal Party while not offending the English-speaking majority. Prime Minister King had few options among his existing Quebec ministers. Chubby Power, Charles Gavin Power, was popular and bilingual, but a little too fond of the bottle and even worse, perhaps, of Irish descent. Arthur Cardin was an individualist and what's more, had just suffered a heart attack. Senator Dandurand would have fit the bill when it came to distinction but he was 80 years old. The Quebec backbench was to be charitable, was to be charitable, lack lost, luster. So initially, Mackenzie King had the Quebec liberal premier, Adélard Godbout, in his sights. In power since 1939, and a steadfast ally of King and the federal government's war effort, Godbout seemed to be the obvious choice. It was common custom then for uh, federal leaders to poach provincial premiers and uh, lure them into federal politics. Uh, Jimmy Gardner had been recruited from Saskatchewan, Angus L. MacDonald from Nova Scotia, and Stuart Garson, for instance, would make the leap from the Manitoba premiership to the Ottawa stage a few years after. Initially tempted, Godbu demurred arguing that his departure from Quebec City would weaken the party, his party, which faced a very strong opponent at home in the person of Maurice Duplessis, leader of the Union Nationale. It was then that Mackenzie King's attention turned to a very distinguished, indeed patrician, 59-year-old bilingual Quebec City lawyer, Saint Laurent who received an unexpected phone call while sitting down to family dinner the night of December 4th, 1941. In many respects, Saint Laurent was an unlikely heir to Minister Lapointe. Born in 1882, he had spent most of his career as a corporate lawyer, acting on behalf of large pulp and paper firms. He had never been closely involved in politics, except obliquely as a lawyer chosen both by the Quebec and successive federal governments. His career path then bears no resemblance to that of so many uh, past and future prime ministers who seem to have started climbing the political ladder in their teenage years, stubbornly working at it until they reached the top rung. I'm thinking of MacDonald, Laurier, or closer to our time, Diefenbaker, Mulroney, Chrétien, all political animals from a tender age. Not so for Saint Laurent, and that's one key to understanding his personality and his political style. Until he was nearly 60, he hadn't needed politics to make his life complete. Nor did he have a material need to engage in politics. He had achieved and viable success without it. When the fateful phone call came, Saint Laurent was already, in 1941, earning $50,000 a year, a princely sum at the time, and had a private chauffeur as well as a maid and a cook. He and his family vacationed in Europe almost every year. It was certainly not the 12,000 annual salary of a minister that lured him into politics, but an old-fashioned sense of duty. In December 1941, he wasn't seeking anything. The telephone just rang. In other respects, one can argue that the choice of Saint Laurent was a stroke of genius for Mackenzie King. For one thing, precisely because Saint Laurent did not carry the lifelong baggage of political involvement, he was seen as a clean man, a new man, 
rather than a battle-scarred Politico with IOUs here and there and surely a few skeletons hidden. For another, if Nanos Research, you know the polling firm, had existed in 1941, they would have seen Saint Laurent as a dream asset when it came to political marketing for the Liberal Party. Not only was he a successful lawyer, generating and oozing an aura of competence, he was also seen as a French Canadian. After all, what could be more French than a surname such as Saint Laurent? On his father's side, he was eighth generation French Canadian. His ancestor had settled in New France in 1660. The first two considerations, competence and pure laine, would ensure that French Canadians would be proud to rally en masse behind one of their own. And yet, Saint Laurent also embodied Canadian bilingualism. Since his middle name was Stephen, courtesy of his mother, Mary Ann Broderick, a school mistress of Irish Catholic lineage who had immigrated from County Galway in 1847. She never spoke French and forbade her children to speak French to her. In addition, Saint Laurent's birthplace was Compton, in the eastern townships, a microcosm of Canada in its demographic mix, religious, linguistic, and so on. Saint Laurent's professional associates and clients also tended more often than not to be Anglophone, and he had never shown sympathy for any variety of French Canadian nationalism, whether that of Henri Bourassa, Lionel Groux, or Maurice Duplessis. That is, I argue, another key to understanding Saint Laurent, his innate, embedded, substantive bilingualism. For him, constant immersion and jockeying between the two languages were neither a handicap nor a political stance, not something to fight for or to claim or to proclaim. For him, it was all spontaneous and natural. Since he, in his family, schooling, and personal life, embodied such ethnic and linguistic harmony? Why wasn't this the case across the country? Throughout his political career, Saint Laurent was given to many states, was given to state movements, praising Canadians for their happy linguistic coexistence. He also to do anything concrete or heaven forbid coercive to ensure that such desirable coexistence was in fact made feasible through legal or administrative reforms. Uh, it is thus one of the ironies of the Saint Laurent years that this half French Canadian prime minister accomplished almost nothing to advance the effective use or protection of the French language. That would come immediately afterwards with the solidly unilingual Diefenbaker and Pierce. Such is the man Mackenzie King called to his side in late 1941. Saint Laurent was sworn in as justice minister and immediately started to fill Lapointe's role as the prime minister's eyes and ears in Quebec. It is fair to add, however, that Saint Laurent saw his role as relatively one-sided, limited to conveying the attitudes and policies of Mackenzie King and the federal government to Quebec, and particularly to French speakers. There are few instances in which Saint Laurent, unlike his predecessor Lapointe, chose to act as an interpreter for his people, hoping to persuade the prime minister or the anglophone majority in caucus or cabinet to mend their ways. This may be due either to Saint Laurent's conciliatory personality or to his instinctive and principled dislike of what he easily perceived as excessive French-Canadian nationalism. Appropriately, Saint Laurent gained a seat in the Commons in early 1942 in the riding of Quebec East, succeeding the late Ernest Lapointe. The riding had been Lapointe's since 1919 and had previously been represented by Wilfrid Laurier for 42 years, a safe liberal bastion if there ever was one. 
the first pressing issue confronting Saint Laurent during the war was the conscription crisis. Well aware of the trauma caused by the conservative government's imposition of overseas conscription in 1917, the liberals had uh, um, successively gained an overwhelming majority of seats in Quebec, in particular during the previous federal election, vowing hands on hearts that they would never allow it. And yet pressure was mounting in military circles in 1942 for Prime Minister King to reverse his promise. In order to break the impasse and to enable the government to, in uh, the astute Mackenzie King uh, wording, declare conscription if necessary, but not necessarily conscription, a pan-Canadian referendum was held in April 1942. A huge majority of Quebecers voted no. No, we don't want to release the federal government from, from his earlier promise while the rest of Canada voted overwhelmingly, or majority, yes. The yes vote thus prevailed in the overall plebiscite. However, thanks to Mackenzie King's delaying of actual conscription until, until the late fall of 1944, and in view of the alternative, a conservative government that would have no qualms about decreeing conscription on the double, King, Saint Laurent, and the Liberals didn't emerge terribly bruised at the polls when the next election came in 1945. New life, post-war life. S soon after the war, Mackenzie King transferred Saint Laurent to the position of Secretary of State for External Affairs. With a certain Lester B. Pearson as his deputy minister, Saint Laurent inaugurated what has been called the golden age of Canadian diplomacy. He shared his leader's resolute commitment to Canadian autonomy on the world stage, particularly vis-à-vis -vis Britain. We must add that Saint Laurent was exceptionally well served by the circumstances. An exhausted and nearly bankrupt United Kingdom, uh, facing an immense decolonization problem in India and Pakistan, was in no position to maintain a tight grip on its dominions. The rest of Europe was un undergoing painful reconstruction, and much of Africa and Asia was starting to show discontent with its colonial masters. Canada had free reign to occupy the position of a middle power since the country was not dramatically hampered by the war years, and it was prosperous, politically stable, and untainted by colonial adventures. Canada became an original member of the United Nations in 1945 and started to participate actively in various international forums. The highly ambitious civil servants in external affairs were busy expanding Canadian visibility and credibility. In 1949, Canada would become an original member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And by then, it had become unthinkable for Canada to join in any other guise than as a country wholly distinct from the UK. Mackenzie King finally agreed to resign in 1948. His protégé, Louis Saint Laurent, was chosen decisively with 69% of support on the first ballot of the, at the Liberal Leadership Convention held at the Ottawa Coliseum in August. And so it happened that the Quebec City lawyer who had reluctantly agreed to join the cabinet in 1941, just for a year or two, he had insisted, out of patriotic duty, had, be, had been so enchanted by the siren song of politics that he found himself prime minister at age 66. He would remain in office for nine years, winning back-to-back -back majorities in 1949 and 1953, but losing to the progressive conservatives in 57. Saint Laurent would resign as liberal leader in early 1958 to be succeeded by Pearson. This indefatigable man then returned to his law practice 
dying in 1973 at the venerable age of 91. How can his more than 3,000 days in power be summarized? Uh, then the historian has to make a selection. Behind the ebb and flow of all of the files with which Saint Laurent dealt, I think that his tenure as prime minister reflects two key considerations, Canadian political affirmation and Canadian infrastructure projects. Of course, there are other legacies we might look at, but to avoid taxing your patience, I have chosen not to elaborate on such achievements as his government's territorial completion of confederation, when Newfoundland was welcomed as Canada's 10th province, or the mitigation of regional inequities through the adoption of transfer payments to have-not provinces, or advances in our social safety net. Think universal age, old age pensions in 1951 and hospital insurance later on. In, in a more full-featured presentation, these and more would certainly deserve to be covered. However, to return to our two key categories by Canadian political affirmation, I mean continuation of the long haul process initiated by Laurier and Borden, but accelerated by Mackenzie King to loosen the ties between Canada and the mother country. Saint Laurent was not a rabid Brit baiter. He just thought that the days foretold prophetically by Laurier had come that the time for colonial subservience had expired, the, and that two world wars, economic growth, and Canada's own internal evolution had amply shown that the country could walk on its own two legs. In addition to joining the UN and NATO as a wholly independent country, Canada developed a closer relationship with the United States, militarily, diplomatically, and of course, economically. Canada's involvement in the Korean War between 1950 and 1953 was wholly independent from Britain and was based strictly on voluntary enlistment. There was no question of Saint Laurent having to awaken the conscription werewolf. In 1952, a Canadian-born Governor General, Vincent Massey, was appointed for the first time, setting a precedent. too enthusiastic, the Supreme Court of Canada in 1949 effectively became supreme when appeals to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council in London were ended. And who can forget the Suez crisis in 1956 uh, when Canada decided to disagree publicly with Britain and France over military intervention in Egypt. One of the last affirmationist decisions of the Saint Laurent government in 1957 was to create the Canada Council, uh, later called the Canada Council for the Arts, modeled ironically after the British Council, to encourage Canadian talent and to foster a sense of common nationhood through culture. As a very practical corporate lawyer type, Saint Laurent was initially very reluctant to quote him, we cannot afford to set up the Canada Council. We have no money for this, for the social sciences and the arts and these painters and all this. But he eventually agreed. And during this period, the National Library of Canada was founded also in 1954. There was no progress, however, on the Canadian flag because the King government had burned its fingers trying to adopt a new one in 1947, as we know that torch would not be taken up again until 1964 under Pearson. But in a similar symbolic vein, under Saint Laurent, the word dominion was being phased out on official documents and signs. With its colonial undertone, the word must have rankled Saint Laurent because he declared in the House of Commons I can say at once that it is the policy of this government when statutes 
come up for review or consolidating to replace the word Dominion with the word Canada. And the Saint Laurent government pushed for the new sovereign, Queen Elizabeth II, to be explicitly and not just implicitly designated as the Queen of Canada in a 1953 federal statute, the Royal Style and Titles Act. I will concede to you that there is nothing revolutionary in this Canadian affirmation. No Tea Party, no storming of the Bastille here. That's not just the Canadian way. And granted, numerous visible signs of attachment to Britain and to the monarchy remained from the red and sign flag to the Royal Canadian Navy and the Royal Canadian Mint. Even our mail remained royal until the late 1960s. Nonetheless, a series of gestures and decisions, large and small, concrete and symbolic, amounted to what a conservative-minded historian, Donald Creighton, called the Forked Road. It was a road away from Britain, closer to continental harmony and openness to the rest of the world, and above all, a confident assertion of the country's own personality. the aptly named St. Lawrence Seaway. The second broad category for which uh, uh, Prime Minister St. Laurent deserves to be remembered is the building of various Canadian structural projects that benefited both the economy and a sense of common nationhood. In a sense, these were the continuation and completion of the railway and post office grids that had begun some 50 years earlier. The St. Lawrence Seaway is the first of these I'd like to mention. I'll mention four, and then you'll be relieved. A, a five-year massive construction project launched in 1954, costing $470 million, that is over $4 billion in today's dollars, enabling ocean-going vessels to sail past Montreal and into the heart of the continent. CBC Television and its French counterpart, Radio-Canada, were another such project. The CBC radio network had existed since 1936, I think, but public television was born in September 1952. Within three years, the CBC Radio-Canada network covered two-thirds of the Canadian population, serving as a link between various regions and as a counterpart to American public channels. It helped affirm and develop a distinctive Canadian voice on the airwaves on, of information, culture, and entertainment. The third project I'd like to mention is the Trans-Canada Highway. Again, both a utilitarian enterprise, as they were wide discrepancies in the ways in which Canadian communities were served by roadways, and a tool to enhance national identity. The federal government contributed a good share of the cost, giving incentives to the provinces. The project, 8,000 kilometers long, from Victoria to St. John's, Newfoundland, was decided in 1948, physically started in 1950, and inaugurated in 1962 under the Diefenbaker government. The TCAN, as it came to be known, was developed in parallel to the US interstate highway system. The fourth and last project I'd like to discuss was also the most controversial, the Trans-Canada Pipeline. Controversy didn't arise for the reasons that one might expect today such as environmental hazards or disregard for the sovereignty or and or livelihood of indigenous peoples. It had to do with cost overruns, private American versus public Canadian involvement, risks and benefits, and even a stock trading scandal to spice things up. A memorable parliamentary debate raged in May and June 1956 during which zoological epithets were hurled and fists were raised. 
Without going into further crusty detail, the fact remains that a 3,700 kilometer long pipeline providing a west, a west to east conduit for natural gas, four feet in diameter, was completed in 1958, linking Burstall, Saskatchewan, near the Alberta bird, uh, border, to Montreal. Yes, it had blasted 9 million cubic yards of dirt and rock across the lands of more than 5,000 uh, semi-voluntary owners, but the pipeline was a technological achievement providing both economic benefit and national and symbolic stimulus. Now, just try something and... Um, I'm just trying to uh, get to the first slide, so it won't be too long. Ah. This is my concluding first and uh, initial and concluding slide. Things came to an end for Saint Laurent's government in June 1957, when it was narrowly defeated by John D. Baker's Tories. 22 consecutive years of liberal power had brought an inevitable fatigue and a definite sense of complacency and arrogance. Saint Laurent's energetic minister of everything, C.D. Howe, was famous for quips such as, what's a million? And who can stop us? Many of Saint Laurent's ministers were no longer spring chickens. Howe, for instance, and Jimmy Gardner were from the uh, crop of 1935, and few had novel ideas. The leader himself had memory lapses and frequent bouts of, let's say, absent-mindedness. It was surely time for the country to turn the page. Sixty years later, however, it may be time for us collectively to do better at remembering Saint Laurent the man as well as his years in politics and his legacy. Thanks much to your attention. Mm. Mm. Merci. Vous voulez être ici? OK. Very good. Do you give instructions and orders? Very good. So I, I, I just passively, uh, uh, passivity is uh, is bliss. Very good. No, it's a deep question, but did Saint Laurent and Duplessis know each other like socially or anything like that? Oh yes, and they disliked uh, one another thor th thoroughly and cor and cordially. Uh, in a in a sense. Um, Duplessis was born of the, uh, among the well-established but financially modest rural uh, bourgeoisie, whereas Saint Laurent was born in the same side of the same type of setting. You know, his father was a m the general merchant. I think I forgot to mention it, uh, but however, due to his uh, impeccable studies and his talent and a mix of luck and whatever makes a man and a woman more successful than others, you know, a, a combination of things. Uh, Saint, La Saint Laurent, you know, uh, uh, lived the high life, had uh, high contacts, and in the eye of, uh, Saint L of Duplessis was a dénationalisé. Like he, he, like, uh, he, had, inti he had integrated the, the point of view on French Canadians held by Anglo-Canadians. Uh, that, that was uh, essentially, to summarize, that was Duplessis' attitude. Uh, in all fairness, uh, uh, Saint Laurent's view of Duplessis was a hopelessly parochial small town later, incapable of, s of seeing behind his navel. The, uh, so that's the personal perception. Uh, on the surface of things, they had many things together. They were only eight years apart in age, 
they were lawyers, French-speaking, or at least solidly half French-speaking. So, uh, they had many things in common, but they had their psychological and um, class dif differences. Constitutionally, Saint Laurent uh, was also a smiling advocate of, if not centralization, I mean, he, he completely went along with the general tendency of the post late 1930s ambiance in Ottawa that equated material progress, social progress, and a greater amount of powers held in the hands of the, auto, of the federal government. Uh, Saint Laurent had his conservative uh, instinct and his cautious and prudent instinct, but by and large, he was happy with the general unfolding of things, and he is renowned for having uttered these damning words. Le Québec est une province comme les autres. Québec is a, is a province just like the others, which te technically or constitutionally is absolutely the, the perfect truth. It's just a type of perfect truth that you never utter aloud. <laughs> I've never seen a picture of the Trans-Canada like that going all across the country, and I was wondering if you um, had any insights about why, uh, what was the push, the political reason for doing the Trans-Canada then? Was it, uh, and was it, it sort of ends and then goes in through Newfoundland, which I'd never really, was mm -hmm. part of it to bring Newfoundland in, or why then, why the Trans-Canada then? I'm I'm afraid uh, this is a perfectly valid point, and I don't know enough in depth to answer you. I have a superficial uh, knowledge of the transportation issue, so I, I, I would be afraid to mislead or, or, or offer plausible, but not necessarily accurate answers. So I'll note your question, and if I am wise, I will research it, and one of these days I'll, I'll know the answer. I, I'm afraid. Wait. On that point, I uh, was reading the, the Louis Saint Laurent book this afternoon in the car from <laughs> Southern Ontario, and, at, uh, and I was really struck by the Trans Canada point because it said before the Trans Canada, you couldn't cross mm -hmm. the country in Canada. You had to be, go through the states in both BC and Ontario. And in Newfoundland, you didn't have. So this is the superficial answer. I'll take it on. No, 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 I but uh, no, no, I, I heartily nod. <laughs> I just was so taken with that fact. I am a Western Canadian, uh, so it was just really amazing for me to discover that uh, I think in Newfoundland as well, there was a large part of the, the province without roads or crossing. My really good little I crossed back and forth across Canada in the 50s a number of times from Montreal to Edmonton, which was my home. And every time we had to go south into the States at Sault Ste. Marie, and then we crossed because we did not have sufficient uh, east-west roads that would go completely across the provinces. You could go across for maybe 100 miles, then you'd have to turn north, and then you'd have to go north for maybe 40, and then you'd have to turn west again and go for another, and that was the way the roads were in Canada. So it was obvious that we needed to have a roadway that went right across. And mm. actually on my last journey home, we ran into a 12-foot um, chain link fence just at the Ontario border and we could not go through because the official opening of that stretch of the, of the Trans-Canada was the following day. Oh. And there was a conference in the closest town and not a bed to be had, so five of us overnighted in our car until the following morning 
so that we could be the first on that section. And they were actually still blasting here and there. I am originally from the Gaspé, and we did get the Trans Canada somewhere in 2000. <laughs> wait, wait, wait! No, no, it, it's true. It was it was declared officially open in 1962, but it continued to be built and continued to. So because it, hmm. yeah. right. it's like the interstate uh, net uh, system. It, it has been declared officially completed in a given year that I don't recall, but it continues to be, to be built because you never cover enough ground. Yeah, the whole Gaspé Peninsula uh, is, a, is a sort of nightmare in terms of uh, road access. I have a question uh, related to, um, you mentioned Creighton's metaphor of the fork road and St. Laurent's tendency to, to continue to move away from Britain. I'm wondering if you have any knowledge of the attitude or didn't have one towards the possibility of greater integration. Also, I think the period of the Massey report mm. uh, on Canadian culture, and uh, I get, I'm just wondering, are there any events or incidents? A little later on, of course, there was the whole incident, uh, Ethan Baker Pearson and the arming of or taking nuclear arms mm -hmm. onto Canadian territory. But did Saint Laurent have any attitude that we know of towards the United States? From from my knowledge of the event uh, of the years, and I know uh, that my uh, friend Greg Donahue he is in the audience, and if I, if I am incomplete or inaccurate, I count on him to, to complete. From my, my understanding of Saint Laurent, he was content with the new balance that had been achieved post 1945, the uh, loosening loosening of ties with Britain and the simultaneous. Um, closing of ties or rapprochement with Britain, with the US econ economically and militarily I think did not need to be uh, uh, pushed any further they, they were I think a, um, a, a convenient balance, a co new balance for him A two-part question. Uh, did uh, Saint Laurent have any connection with the Arctic? And secondly, do you know why an icebreaker was named after him and not after any of the other prime ministers? To the best of my knowledge, he did not pay any attention to the Arctic. Uh, if I am wrong, uh, I will. It's another thing, li like the tea can. I just realized my uh, I, I have etc. And uh, I think the icebreaker was named because. Uh, major vessels need, need, need to be named about former <laughs> prime ministers. But it, it, it's a valid question, and I may be, may be completely in the wrong. From, from the little I know, it's definitely Prime Minister John Diefenbaker, his immediate successor, who at least symbolically in his speeches um, made the Arctic matter uh, on a grand scale in the eyes of Canadians in general. But I will, I will check if Saint Laurent had a particular fondness. I, I would doubt it, however. But he was not a poet, unlike Diefenbaker, who had many bad sides, but B Diefenbaker could be a sincere visionary or seer or poet or mystic in his way. So I, I think Saint Laurent was too much of a practical person to be enamored of the uh, aura of the North. But if I am wrong, I'll I will be happy to be proven wrong.
entire period of his reign that there was no scandal, no juicy bits, <laughs> nothing the equivalent of Gerda Munzinger, and is that when we got the reputation that Canada was such a well, boring country? This is unfortunate, but this is the uh, un, uh, uh, very sorry result of a ambitious, relatively young, talented group of civil service mandarins who are sincerely imbued with social welfare and are not yet stuck in their rut, plus an extremely experienced cadre of ministers. They are probably the most competent cabinet ministers that have ever been assembled around a table with a mixture of the gray-haired uh, you know, solid workhorses and some young and ambitious uh, Colts like uh, Jimmy Sinclair, Justin Trudeau's grandfather, Jean Lesage, a few others, and Saint Laurent himself, who, uh, as I have uh, argued, did not need politics uh, neither for financial uh, fulfillment or uh, uh, questions of prestige. Really thought, well, he came to like it because he liked to run things, but. He, he, he essentially run, ran things as uh, uh, he, he, saw, he saw fit, and he was not animated by the fighting and calculating instinct of so many partisan minds. Add to this uh, favorable economic circumstances, not entirely due to, uh, uh, not entirely to be credited to Saint Laurent himself, but there was a Europe and a Japan to rebuild from scratch after 1945. And hey, we had the timber and we had the, uh, we had the wheat and we have the nickel. And so by and large, of course, there were uh, you know, um, questionable uh, transactions, etc. But like, for instance, in terms of uh, behavior among the parliamentary wings, Nothing of the disgrace that occurred in the Pearson uh, mandate or in the first years of the Mulroney mandate, for instance. And in, in terms of women and all that, no, no, no. In, look for Britain at, this, at the same period. And in Canada, we had our thing. Uh, Munsinger, but that's, that was after. No, 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 Saint Laurent is the boring type who stayed married to his wife for 71 years. And, um, I'm. I'm a disappointment in this regard. <laughs> 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 yes, were, th were there any severe divisions at all between cabinet ministers in Saint Laurent's cabinet? And if so, how did he handle that? Um, divisions between ministers? Or ministers in Saint Laurent. Saint Laurent had a natural aura that came from, uh, from his age, from his style and personality, and from the fact that he, he worked extremely long hours and he, it, he did not have to show or boast to make it known, and he came to the table very well prepared, usually as well prepared as any of his ministers. So he had a certain aura. It was said that uh, often when he, uh, most of the time when he entered the room, any room, his ministers was, would spontaneously rise, as they no longer do today. Um, the, I don't have time to discuss particular interaction with uh, dissenting ministers, and definitely there were a few, because they, are, they were the more uh, social and um, principle oriented like uh, Claxton and Martin and the more down to earth and some of the old fashioned you know politicos and uh, star with um, with a l l inferior ratio of idealism but essentially he, he was res he was respected for his age competence hard work and the fact that he was the cement holding them I, I, I need to provide a summary, because o otherwise we would sort of anecdotally go into it. Yeah. It's not uh, uninteresting as a question, and if you allowed me a quick postscript. Um, <coughs> I would compare this with uh, Chrétien, Chrétien with his ministers. 
Uh, Jean Chrétien was, and I, I try to speak here is as a non-partisan way as I can. Chrétien was surrounded in the 1990s with very competent ministers. And I think the way he managed to maintain the lid over the occasionally boiling pot was through the prestige that he uh, emanated because he had been in the arena for 30 years before becoming prime minister. He had seen everything, he had been everywhere, and that he, uh, he, w he was afforded respect. He was not necessarily the most competent in terms of file A, file B. He was not a wonk the, the way that uh, Saint Laurent was, but he earned respect due to, uh, due to his age and character and style. And also he, Chrétien, like Saint Laurent, was a chairman of the board. He was not in an interventionist micromanager the way that Diefenbaker or Stephen Harper uh, have been. Saint Laurent was perfectly happy to have his minister or his regional director do their job. H his days were amply, uh, uh, amp were full enough without him having to overdo, uh, oversight everything. A too long response to a very interesting question. <laughs>